Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on what it takes to cover the planet. Thank you so much for joining us today, taking some time out of your busy day to be with us. Uh, my name is James Fawn. I'm the uh, executive director of Internews' Earth Journalism Network. We are a global community of over 25,000 journalists around the world dedicated to covering climate change and the environment. And we are also a project of Internews. I will have the honor of being your moderator today. I'm, I'm so pleased that we have a very intriguing panel to join us in speaking about uh, what it takes to be a climate or environment, environmental journalist. Um, I'm gonna introduce them in a moment. First, let me explain what we're doing here, why we're here, what we're gonna be talking about. Um, back last year in 2023 um ejn as we were getting ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary we embarked on a landmark research project to seek insights into the state of climate and environmental journalism around the world we wanted to know what are the challenges facing uh we face in producing high quality journalism whether it's disinformation or misinformation diminished press freedom just the lack of resources? What are the strategies that journalists, newsrooms, and funding organizations can employ to improve the media landscape? The resulting report is called Covering the Planet, um, and it features survey responses from 744 journalists in 102 countries and interviews with 74 journalists in 31 countries. So it's really the largest global study of its kind. It was carried out by researchers at Deakin University, uh, and uh, we are grateful for their help. Uh, now, four months after the report's launch, we want to continue this conversation with stakeholders in the field. In this chat, we're going to discuss the needs of climate and environmental journalists on the ground, as well as media outlets, and explore how the report's recommendations could be realized. Uh, and with us today to discuss that, we have Dr. Gabby Mokata, now the Senior Research Fellow in Climate Science Communication at the University of Tasmania. Uh, and she she was the Covering the Planet re lead researcher. She is now at, at the University of Tasmania. Thank, thank you for joining us, Gabby. We also have Rhett Butler, the award-winning founder and CEO of Manga Bay, the very well-known and respected Edit, uh, environmental media outlet. Thank you, Rhett. Um, we uh, are hoping to have Paul Amarogbe, the features editor and environmental journalist at the Nigerian Tribune. I know he's had some trouble logging on to the Zoom, but hopefully he joins us soon. I'm here. All right, Paul, thank you. Glad you made it. Yeah. And uh, we have Amy Sim, the senior program officer at Internews and the director of EGN Asia Pacific. Um, we uh, we had hoped that Seba Chauhan, the program manager for climate engagement at the IKEA Foundation could join us. Unfortunately, she came down with the flu and uh, yesterday she lost her voice. So uh, she wouldn't have been able to say much. Uh, we really regret she can't join us. Uh, Seba, if you're out there, I, we hope you get well soon. And Amy, thank you for stepping in at the last minute. We really appreciate it. Okay, let's let's start off with a, a look at the report itself, uh, a briefing on the report and its findings and recommendations. Gabby, I'm going to kick it over to you, please, to start us off with with that uh, briefing. Right. Can you all hear me? Sure. Okay. Thank. Thanks for that excellent introduction, and um, ah, thanks for for the opportunity to have undertaken this work, which has just been so fascinating and um, such an insight for all of us as researchers. But we're really also happy to be able to share this this work in the forum today. Um, so what I'm going to do today is give you a really quick overview of some of the key findings and relate to them some of the recommendations of the report. I can't cover everything. It was, the report ended up being, I think, 112 pages. It was really big. It was a big piece of work um, and there were 21 recommendations. So I'm just going to touch on a few key things uh, to get you orientated. So as uh 
as James so beautifully introduced this work, it, this was a really global study, perhaps the first truly global study of climate change and environmental journalism. Um, and we really aim to centre within the study insights and voices of a really large cohort of international journalists. And some of those figures you've already given, James, but I'll just reiterate, it sometimes helps to see them on the screen. Uh, we, we engaged with 818 journalists and editors in total. Um, 744 of those editors and journalists responded to our survey. And we worked with journalists and editors in 102 countries in that survey, and then an additional 31 countries, um, sorry, no, journalists from 74 countries and, and, and editors as well from, sorry, I'll say it again, it is 11 o'clock at night here. Uh, we had 74 journalists and editors from 31 countries who uh, were interviewed by us. So we had a team of uh, six people um, from, uh, I was at that time at Deakin University now, as James said, I've moved, so um, this was undertaken by Deakin, which is a university in Melbourne, in Australia. Uh, so this uh, study really asked some, some key questions about the current state of climate and environmental journalism. We wanted to know what that state is. What are the obstacles and enablers for, for reporting on climate uh, change and the environment? What do journalists need to increase their capacity for doing this reporting? And what role can funding organisations play in supporting climate and environmental journalists broadly and globally? We had some more detailed research questions as well, but those were kind of the, the, the leading questions that, that um, you know, informed our research overall. Um, I'm not going to go into detailed methodology and so on here, but I'm going to tell you what we found and then we'll go on to recommendations. So we found a really thriving and vibrant and dedicated community of journalists, people who really care about this work uh, and want to do it well. Uh, but we also found that this is a landscape that's challenging for those journalists to, to undertake the work. Um, and all over the world, uh, in high income and lower and middle income countries, journalists have diverse needs for support um, and funding and training to help them better report today's most crucial stories. So a good news slide to start with. Um, we, we heard from all the journalists that we, that we engaged with um, that coverage in their perception seems to have increased over time, but it's still not enough. So 77% of journalists that we talked with um, and asked uh, this question of in the survey perceive that coverage of climate and environment has increased over time. So it's getting, getting more, which is what, we're not, what we want to hear and what we want to know. 82% of journalists reported that that uh, climate and environment stories have more promin prominence than they did uh, 10 years ago, which is, of course, important for audiences' perception. And 60% um, of journalists think that this increased cover coverage is mainly due to increase in environmental problems. Um, that was the, the main motivator for that increase. But journalists, and we would all, I think, agree with this, say that the volume of climate change coverage is, is still not commensurate with the seriousness of the problem, that we need to see so much more of it. So some of us, our first recommendations, and these are just top line summaries. There's much more depth in the report if you'd like to jump into that. But we know that in order to increase that coverage, a couple of the things that can happen are that newsrooms newsrooms should encourage specialisation in climate change and environmental reporting. We need journalists who know this subject matter inside out. We also think that newsrooms can foster collaboration and knowledge sharing between journalists uh, with the idea that all stories are fundamentally climate stories now. Um, and so, you know, the, it's not just the climate journalists if there are specialised journalists that should be covering climate change, climate change should feature in many, many stories, perhaps all stories. I'll move on. Now, we know, as James said, that resources are a key limiting factor for environmental reporting. Um, and we found that adequate funding for, for doing this work is lacking in most countries, not just lower income settings. Um, most journalists, so 76% of the journalists that we engage with noted that they that their, their coverage is limited by this lack of resources um, and uh, they could do more if they had more, more funding. Here are a couple of comments from journalists, people that we interviewed um, when asked what, what a main obstacle for climate and environmental reporting was. Uh, a journalist said, I think the main one is resources. Up until a few months ago, there was no 
uh, climate team at their media outlet or any resources really, I always had to hustle to get stuff done, beg, borrow, steal. And another journalist talked about needing to travel and not having the resources to do so. He said, if you want to do a good climate story, you have to go to local communities. But most of these communities are not just in the city where we are, but they're far off. And that journalist reported not having the resources to, to do so as often as he'd like to. Uh, journalists in, in a widespread way talked about professional precarity impacting their work. Um, and they said that well, one journalist said, what helps me do my job better is when I feel like I have a uh, have uh, good job security, fair wages, and I have the support of my organisation. And that can only happen when you're working for an organisation that's paying you a living wage and you feel like you're not going to lose your job tomorrow. So that idea of professional precarity and needing the support of an organisation to do this work in a long-term way was something that we heard as well. So a couple of recommendations related to this. We think that funders could make more support available for journalists covering climate and environment, goes without saying. Um, we think that funders should prioritise uh, supporting climate and environmental journalism now, particularly given the urgent nature of the issues. Um, and we need to amplify the, the salience of these issues for audiences, so we need to see more coverage. We also know that misinformation thrives where accurate information is insufficient. So that's another reason for funders amplifying coverage by, by funding it uh, more. We also think that funders should work with journalists and newsrooms for a focused approach and longevity of funding. We heard uh, many journalists say that um, uh, short-term funding wasn't as useful as long-term funding that they knew that they could rely on. So we think that funders can assist news outlets and uh, outlets and individual journalists um, by helping them build capacity and working towards sustainability for newsrooms and for their work. Uh, to do that, as I said, multi-year funding is, is better for capacity building than more a more scattergun, perhaps more widespread um, short-term approach. Right, to, to turn to a different point, we all know that doing the work of environmental journalism is sometimes unsafe. Um, we asked journalists whether they or their media outlet had ever faced physical or digital threats because of coverage of the environment or climate change. And here are the results. 39% of journalists said that they are sometimes or frequently threatened in this context. And we we heard, we worked out the journalists in 75 out of, out of 102 countries face threats due to the work that they undertake. This was picked up in um, in The Guardian, actually, um, when we published the report, which is really exciting. So that got some widespread um, international coverage. A couple of examples. One Peruvian journalist told us that they'd been kidnapped when reporting in the Amazon in the course of their work. An Indian journalist reported frequent incidents of sexual harassment. And journalists from Ecuador told us that they'd been threatened and legally harassed as, as a result of their environmental reporting. We also know that the often remote nature of the work that environmental and climate journalists undertake and often the need to be on the ground after a natural disaster can make the work dangerous too. And we also know that a, a key danger is uh, the powerful interests that journalists uncover, investigate, investigate and reveal for their audiences. So all sorts of um, different types of danger that face journalists doing this work. We know as a result of this that self-censorship is increasing. 39% um, of journalists feel the need to self-censor. And uh, we asked journalists, you know, who, who or what caused them to feel that need to self-censor when they were uh, covering climate and environment. 42% um, said that those undertaking illegal activity caused them to feel the need to self-censor. And 41% it was actually said, said it was a government that made them feel this way. Um, of journalists who self-censored, 45% said that this tendency or this need had increased over the last decade. So things are getting worse in, in that sense. So some of our recommendations from, from the report in relation to this, we think that newsrooms could work to protect journalists' physical, legal and digital safety in the following ways, that they could work within national legal frameworks where they exist and with international journalist defence organisations to, to better protect journalists. And we think also that funders could work with newsrooms and journalists to deliver training on ways to avoid threats becoming more dangerous, if that in is indeed possible in those particular country contexts. This was a really shocking uh, and interesting finding. If you look at that graph on the right-hand side of the page, 
it's looking at um, the journalists, I'm just trying to move my bars around so I can see, the inclusion of sources um, who are sceptical of climate change across 34 countries, um, 706 respondents. And as you can see, some countries, in some countries, journalists do tend to include climate sceptical sources and others, they don't at all. So in some, in some countries, 100% um, of journalists said that they do this in the name of balance and other ones not. So have a look at that while I'm talking. But um, across the whole survey, 62% of journalists reported including statements from sources sceptical of anthropogenic climate change in the name of balance. So that journalistic norm, that long held journalistic norm of balance, which we thought we thought that tendency had changed over time and this balances bias uh, wasn't happening so much anymore, but it clearly is. And it looks like the research um, has, has focused mainly um, on Global North, uh, the academic research on, on balance as bias and hasn't cared to, um, you know, take a truly global perspective on, on um, how journalists include balance in relation to climate change. So the tendency, as you can see, varied widely between countries, but it's something really important and it's a, it's a key finding of this research. So we think to counter um, this kind of tendency, funders should consider journalists' diverse training needs in different country contexts. Um, training can be you know, sub subject-specific information, things like attribution science and how to access data and identifying mis- and disinformation and you know, perspectives on, on climate justice but also education around professional norms like the use of balance that I've just referred to. Um, funders and newsrooms should consider doing this in person, in in-person uh, workshops if possible, to enable networking and collaboration. And this training is needed in all country contexts. It's needed in all country contexts, not just in um, lower to middle income countries, but in high income countries as well. And journalists themselves need to take some responsibility here and they should avoid providing a platform for sources that deny climate change. Uh, another key finding was that journalists uh, that we engaged with said that they were reluctant to advocate. So they, they have some um, really nuanced role conceptions in relation to objectivity and advocacy. About a quarter of journalists that we engaged with only a quarter said that they felt comfortable advocating for particular policy measures or particular responses um, to climate change and environment. Um, some did agree with what they called taking a position, but most journalists we spoke to aligned with a, a so-called objectivity norm. And we know objectivity itself has been disputed in journalism. So here are quickly uh, a few points from journalists. Um, one said, uh, I don't see my role as the role of a campaigner. I'm not here to campaign for climate action. I'm not here to tell people what to do about climate change. I'm here to help them navigate the sea of information around climate change. That's my role. Another journalist said, as a journalist, we should maintain objectivity, but it can be difficult, especially if you're from these communities. For me as a Fijian, it's hard to remain objective because I'm talking about my aunt, I'm talking about my uncle, I'm talking about my family home. Even if it's from another village, we're all related. So, you know, journalists feeling really connected with their communities and, and reporting on those communities in relation to climate and environment. This journalist, I believe from, from Australia, said advocacy is about talking about the science and the best policies that go with the science. You know, you don't have to be a radical or an activist to advocate. And so for me, the science is very clear. We should be holding governments and businesses to account to ensure that we stick to global agreements on climate change. So I think that could be interpreted as advocacy, but holding people to account on one and a half degrees and on science and policy to get us there. I think that's pretty clear cut. Uh, I'll just read one more. I don't think advocating for the climate, it's an activist thing. I think it's an obvious thing. It's the same as human rights or gender rights. So just a selection. So the recommendations here around objectivity, uh, objectivity and advocacy, we think that funders may need to develop a more nuanced approach to, to the idea of objectivity and advocacy in the journalism they support. We think the journalists well understand how to navigate between these, these two norms. Um, um, between advocating for their communities and and policy action and and journalistic objectivity as a as a journalistic norm, and we think a requirement not to advocate should not be a condition of funding. Um, we also think the journalists need to carefully consider their own and their media outlets position on on objectivity and advocacy. Um, and these things may not be mutually exclusive when reporting on climate and environment. 
we found that misinformation is problematic and it's increased over time. 58% um, of the journalists that we, we engaged with said that misinformation had increased in the last decade. And of course, no prizes for guessing the source of information that was overwhelmingly cited as the key one um, was social media. 93% of journalists observed that this was the case. Our recommendations here were that funders and newsrooms can help journalists understand and avoid information, uh, misinformation, that journalists need better training on the varied nature of mis and disinformation in relation to climate and environment, and they need help to better understand where it comes from, how to detect and refute it, and, and how not to proliferate it. Okay, just a couple of, a few more slides to round up. So a key question we asked was, what do you and journalists in your country need to increase capacity to report on climate uh, and environment? And 79% of journalists said, uh, which reflects the, the figure that I gave you right up at the top of the presentation, 79% of journalists said that they need more funding. 75% that they need more uh, percent said that they need more training. But interestingly, factors like media freedom, and personal safety were, were cited less prominently when, when journalists were asked what they, what they wanted, what they needed to amplify that work. Uh, we know that external funding support is absolutely crucial, crucial in the sphere. 80% um, of journalists said that NGO support was needed, and actually only 2% said it was not at all important for them. Um, and uh, really, you know, impactfully for us, um, the journalists that we interviewed said that much climate and environmental journalism would never be produced without donor support and funding. Uh, I don't think I'll read through all of these quotes for you, but I think you know many of many of the journalists we spoke to just emphasised how how crucial it was that they that they had this support. I'll just read one. I think NGOs play a very, very important part in Indonesia to support and boost environmental and climate journalism. They are the go-to resource when it comes to environmental journalism. There were some skepti skeptical, um, there was some skeptical thinking about the relationship between uh, journalism in the global south in particular and NGO support. I'll just read this, this uh, quote here. There are some small initiatives, he said, uh, popping up in the global south, but who is really reading them apart from the donors and the white journalists that speak English, basically? I think that's a massive, massive problem, and that needs to be addressed in some way. So there was some skepticism as well about the donor, um, journalist, and newsroom relationship. Uh, just a quick roundup here. Um, journalists... Uh, really feel strongly that although they need funding, they want to maintain independence. And they, they reported a tension between their need for NGO funding and their desire for independence. Um, journalists prefer this funding not to be tied to particular subject matter. Um, one journalist, for example, said, maybe it would be good uh, for, for uh, funders to be less strict about the topics, because sometimes it's like you can only, you know, uh, do mitigating climate change in only this specific area area of your country, Ecuador, this journalist was from. And, you know, the parameters are too specific and it's hard to find stories when you have those limitations. One journalist in Brazil talked about um, a fun, uh, you can read the quote, but I'll quickly summarise it, um, newsrooms popping up, being funded by um international donors and then when interest moved on from a particular issue uh, then that newsroom potentially could collapse and that person said yeah it looks to me like a bubble I have a feeling that at some point it's going to crash so there we go so a few recommendations funders must avoid donor influence on environmental news coverage and the perception of that influence Funders should also enable journalists to cover the stories they deem most locally relevant. And we think funders should be realistic also when it comes to asking journalists to, to demonstrate impact, the impact of their work. So in summary, covering the planet, doing this work that we've so closely surveyed across the globe is, is um, you know, a privilege and a responsibility in a time of environmental crisis. It's crucial and urgent work, as we all know. Journalists are striving to tell the stories that matter the most, that they care a lot about, and they're doing so right across the planet, but they're trying to do much, often with very little. So supporting and amplifying their work now is really essential. So that's all from me. Um, very happy to, to have a conversation with you all now. 
Uh, but thanks for listening and let me know if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabby, for that very clear and uh, compelling briefing summary of the result uh, report results. Um, and for all of you in the audience, we do have a link in the chat. You can go and see the report for yourself. Um, and as Gabby mentioned, if you have questions, please do let us know. Feel free to submit questions. You would do that in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, okay? So um, if you do have questions, don't put them in the chat. Please put them in the Q&A so that we can go through them. We'll do our best to get to, to questions, but right now we're gonna turn it over to our panelists. Uh, thank you again for joining everyone. Um, we'd love to know, we'll start off with Rhett, Rhett Butler from uh, Manga Bay. Uh, we'd love to know your your reaction to the report. Uh, were the findings were they surprising? Were they were there any that you strongly agreed with or disagreed with? Just let us know your thoughts, please, for about five minutes, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, thank you. So first of all, um, the the report was really excellent, and it aligns with what we've seen at Manga Bay. So Manga Bay has um, we have staff in about thirty countries, and we have um, contributing journalists in about eighty countries. So we're not quite as representative as the as the survey, but um, you know we have a, a, a pretty pretty good look at the situation around the world, and so um, it was nice to see that uh, what was what was portrayed in the report is is also what we've seen personally. So um, I really don't disagree with any of the findings or the recommendations. Um, there are a few things that stood out for me that I thought were you know interesting or I want to underline. So one was. Um, this, you know, 82% of journalists who reported that climate and environmental stories now have more prominence. Um, so I think, you know, just to echo the point that uh, as the effects of environmental deg deg degradation get worse, the stories get relevant to more people. So essentially, we're broadening the constituency around environmental journalism, which I think in the long term is very good for the space, uh, if it's bad for, you know, for people, because we're we're experiencing these these effects firsthand. Um, I thought it was really interesting that 70% of journalists said that they're most likely to approach climate and environmental coverage through a health frame. Uh, that was much higher than I would have thought. I think it's very encouraging, though, because I think, uh, again, going back to the theme of broadening the constituency, health is something that everyone, well, almost everyone would care about. And so it's a really good way to reach people who may not they may not believe in climate change, they may not believe in like environmental integration, you know, whatever, but people do care about health. And so um, I was very encouraged by that figure, but also surprised. Um, I was also surprised by the, 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 like the balance issue in terms of 62% of journalists saying that they included statements from the sources who are skeptical of climate change. Um, that was much, much higher than I expected. Um, so it's, it's an interesting finding for me. Um, you know, the 39% of people who said they are threatened because of their work, um, that, that feels about right to me. I mean, this is a real issue and I think it's an issue that's very much underappreciated in the West because, I mean, I live in the West, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we don't really typically face a lot of threats. I mean, we, we may have trolls on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, but it's not really a threat. Whereas people who are on the front lines and in countries that have less freedom of press. Um, this is a very significant issue. Um, the misinformation number was a little bit lower than I would have expected, because um, I feel like misinformation has gotten worse. But, uh, you know, it's just this is me. But I think that the point there is that, yeah, a lot of people see that misinformation is a big problem. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing that caught my eye, which surprised me was the number of journalists who say they report problems and solution roughly in equal balance. So just speaking strictly from Manga Bay, we have a very a, a, a very heavy split towards the reporting on problems side. And it's actually very hard to get solutions coverage. Um, just in my experience, journalists are more that we work with have been more inclined to focus on problems rather than solutions. So um, that again was an interesting figure for me. Uh, I'll just jump through a few of the recommendations that I thought were were interesting. I mean, again, like these all align with with our experience, but in the funders, the funder space, um, you know, the need to uh, to avoid donor influence on coverage. So, you know, Manga Bay, 
you know, we find there are some partners we can't work with because they, they don't separate the strategic communications, there's communication, there's PR, but some, some funders don't recognize the difference between journalism and like paid communications, paid placement. And so, you know, we just can't work with a funder who doesn't understand the need for object, objectivity and complete independence of the journalism. So I think this is, a, this is like a big problem generally in journalism. Uh, what, what journalism funding is it's just very hard to find funders who understand what journalism is and how it works um and then for journalists i would say the journalist recommendations um yeah just to re-emphasize the the need to make um clear human's dependence on the natural world so i think you know most readers or most people are are, are, are a little bit selfish like they're not going to, they're more likely to read a story that relates to them rather than something that's, you know, esoteric. And so just tying these, the effects of environmental degradation to people's everyday life is a really good way to, to engage people. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Rhett. Those are very uh, interesting insights. Yeah, I, I was surprised by some of those findings too. Uh, and thank you everyone in the audience for your questions and the q and I will say to our panelists, uh, feel free to type your answers to the questions. I don't know if we can get all to, to all of them live. So if you can have have the uh, uh, ability to type some answers in there, I know that would be appreciated. But now we're going to turn it over to Paul Omarogbe from the Nigerian Tribune to hear your thoughts on the report and, and similarly any reactions you may have had. Paul? Okay, so I'd like to say thank you to everyone. Uh, it's great to be here in this space. Um, I'd like to express um, my um, absolute agreement with um, some of the findings. Um, some of the, 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 the like five top priorities that were mentioned for journalists. Um, uh, they said, um, according to reports, more funding for in-depth journalism, 79%. Um, uh, in-person trainings and workshops, 75%, uh, fellowships to attend conferences, 72%. I'm just going to focus on this top three, and I see that um, it's absolutely true. And I think this is actually uh, globally uh, globally true. And I really must thank EJN for making it happen for me. Um, because the EJN, I was able to attend on the ground and report COP27. Uh, the UNCCD in uh, 2024. And my colleagues have also um, benefited from reporting grants to do in-depth stories. I'm talking about my colleagues within the Nigerian Tribune. Um, recently, one of my mentees uh, won uh, covering climate now, uh, climate award for a report that was made possible from grants. So, so all of these um, 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 things that I mentioned underscore the findings in this regard, those top three findings. And then I, I want to speak to the issue of threats, uh, the, according to um, the report, threats to journalists come mainly from uh, those pursuing illegal activities in relation to the environment. In my experience, threats come from state actors. That's in my experience and what I've seen happen. Major environmental crimes come with stick back in uh, and talk about oil fields in the Niger Delta and the mining sites in the northern part of Nigeria. These uh, oil fields are protected by military or par paramilitary groups in the Niger Delta. And then in the north, where critical mining is taking place, lithium mining is taking place massively. Uh, the same thing applies. Uh, there is a gold mining site in Zamfara State. There's a state in Nigeria uh, uh, which is under the supervision of a former governor who has been widely reported to be in cahoots with uh, bandits. And so, and I just want to say that you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mixed bag, really. Yes, major environmental crimes, what we call major, do not happen without someone in authority being in the north. And uh, any journalist who wants to you know, go and dig deep into such things, maybe doing so at the risk of their personal life. And uh, that's basically it for me. There are other things I'd like to speak to, but I guess there'll be time to answer that, specifically talking about um, the issue of how we handle um, climate deniers or climate climate skeptics. Uh, we'll talk about that later, I guess. Thank you. 
Thank you, Paul. Yes, and uh, of course, it's very concerning to hear about the threats from state interests in Nigeria. Um, we're going to turn it over to Amy Sim now, please. Amy, I know you wear many hats, um, but maybe uh, in this case, you could especially put on your funder hat and uh, and and maybe respond to some of the recommendations or findings regarding funding of environmental journalism. But let's hear what you have to say. What was your reaction to the report, please? Thank you. Thanks, James. And um, thank you to Dr. Gabby and your team for this wonderful research. It's been really interesting to read. And uh, as, as Rhett mentioned, um, I find a lot of the findings very aligned to our experience here at EJN. We, we do work with a lot of journalists with interest in covering the environment. Um, and the things that are coming out are def definitely what things we've been hearing as well from the journalists. Um, in terms of uh, findings relating to funding, um, definitely we see uh, a lot of um, requests for funds and fellowships and often we have to, um, you know, uh, spend a lot of time actually uh, at, at EJM we often have a very competitive uh, process where we get a lot of applications for fellowships to the Climate Change Corp, for instance, or um, uh, you know, applications for, for story grants. Um, and we do spend a lot of time to uh, review and select, and there's there's a growing need. Um, and, and so definitely there's a strong need for funding there. And, and often, um, you know, uh, we've been told that without these funds, uh, journalists are not able to uh, report on um, communities who are directly impacted by climate change. Um, um, deforestation and so on, um, and have to rely on on uh, press releases, which is uh, quite worrying. We do see that uh, in in some countries, some regions, like journalists are, you know, because of the the limited resources they have, they are really, you know, working through a lot of uh, press releases, um, you know, to do their stories. And without these uh, additional funding, they won't be able to. Um, you know, report uh, the voices of, of communities most affected. Um, and in terms of uh, funds being tied to, you know, journalists kind of struggling between the need for funds and at the same time donors uh, requiring, um, you know, them to tie, tie, tie to certain uh, subject matter, like in addition to what Rat mentioned about, you know, some funders not understanding um, uh, the difference between, um, you know, strategic communications or PR um, versus journalism. Um, that's also a, a red line for us. You know, we uh, we really um, stress the independence of, of media um, to our funders. And uh, we do also uh, sometimes find it a struggling to a struggle to have to 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 get that point across. But I think in addition to that, what uh, the the findings shows is that also, you know, for certain funding, you know, there are specific themes like focus, you know, getting journalists to focus on uh, natural resource governance or water or hydropower or uh, oceans. And I think for some journalists, uh, they find that a bit restrictive and may not um, directly tie into uh, their needs or their specific contexts. So uh, that that is, uh, you know, sometimes we have to navigate that as kind of, uh, you know, we, because at EJM we do receive funding from from uh, public funders as well as philanthropies, um, and uh, you know, working with journalists to um, find stories and to look at gaps um, in reporting. Um, yeah, and, and so yeah, so it, you know, we we try to look for. Uh, donors that that give us a bit more leverage, you know, like in terms of the subject matter. And we've been lucky with um, funding from the Swedish government, who has been, you know, giving us a multi-year uh, uh, funding uh, project, um, you know, to support journalists, as, uh, you know, Dr. Gabby mentioned, that uh, journalists really prefer kind of support over the years rather than very short one-off workshop here and there, uh, or small, uh, uh, you know, one-off support. Um, so we've been lucky with that and also the, the ability to let um, uh, journalists to decide on themes with that project, the EGN Asia Pacific project. Um, um, you know, journalists can let us know the themes that they think are important to them, that are 
um, underreported in, in their countries and then apply for grants uh, with us. So um, we could do that with that project. With, with other funders, maybe a bit more, more difficult. So I think that's something um, very realistic that we are uh, managing, um, you know, and, and, and trying to uh, work to support um, the journalists um, on the ground. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there and we can continue this conversation. Thank you very much, Amy, and thanks again for stepping in the last minute. Um, so, yeah, uh, appreciate all the responses from our panelists, and uh, let's turn it over to questions. I know we've got some good ones in the Q&A session. Rhett, thank you for uh, taking the time to answer some of them. I, I have a question I want to ask you all about sustainability. This seems to be kind of the uh, foremost issue we're all facing is, you know, how do we keep climate and environmental journalism operating when the overall business of news media is facing financial crisis. Uh, philanthropy has obviously been raised as and, and is uh, a major lifeline to this work, but uh, probably can't be the only source. Um, so I'm wondering what each of you think um, in terms of what strategies we can use as a as a field to get more financial support. Uh, certain that includes whether it's from philanthropy or from other sources. Have you heard of any interesting experiments, to, or are you conducting some some efforts yourself to broaden your financial support? Um, any of you have some thoughts you want to share on that? I might start off with Rhett, if you don't mind. I know that's a big part of the work you do is just trying to make sure you can keep the whole operation going. Um, sure, yeah. So I uh, I started Manga Bay 25 years ago and there was no business model. And then eventually it was an advertising-based business model. And so for the first several years, Manga Bay is based on advertising. Um, but I shifted to a nonprofit model in order to pursue some projects that there wasn't an ad model for. So for example, I wanted to start an Indonesian language news service. And so that's when... I started looking at philanthropy and, you know, foundations and do individual donors. And so I don't have any background in fundraising, running a nonprofit or any connection to wealth. So it was very much sort of like a step into the darkness, um, but it, it's worked out. So we figured it out. Um, and Manga Bay has been on a steady growth trajectory since becoming a nonprofit in 2012. So we've uh, increased from two staff to 110 staff. Um, I, so, so the the sort of philanthropy model has worked well for us um and there are <laughs> there are more rich people who have more money than ever before in history so i don't necessarily think i mean i think diversification is important but uh i think that that is a growth area so continue to pursue that uh i don't think it's necessarily it's, it's not necessarily a bad approach i mean that's what we're focusing on um the key for us is being diversified so no funder is more than six percent of our budget and so we have got like, you know, 30 something foundation funders and institutional funders. Um, and so that means that we have the power to walk away from any grant. Um, and if we lose a grant, you know, it's it's not going to be a crisis for us. And so what I've seen being a, a major problem in this space is that um, some journalism, this is some some outlets have been too dependent on a single funder. So that funder changes their mind or, or like whatever. Um, it's then catastrophic for, for the institution. So I know it's not probably the answer that people want to hear. Um, we have experimented, but we keep coming back to th th this This current model works the best for us. That's it, we are very open-minded. So we're watching as things evolve and testing things. And But so far we keep coming back to this. And so um, in terms of like what we're doing in this specific sort of part of the ecosystem or the funding ecosystem is one of the things we're trying to do is build endowments around specific reporting initiatives and programs. So for example, uh, two years ago, we launched a fellowship program, a paid fellowship program for um, journalists in low and middle income uh, countries. And that is funded as an endowment. So we got, we, we you know, we got a, a, a gift from an individual and, um, you know, every year we draw down 5% off that to, to go into the program. And so that is sustainable, you know, in the long run. Um, we also last year got a 12 year grant um, from another donor. 
And so that allows us to build, you know, there's predictability into it, it allows us to staff up, it allows us to build like long-term story arcs and invest the resources we need into really covering the issue well. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do internally is uh, get a larger share of our funding from individuals. So, you know, historically we've been dependent on foundations for more than half our funding. That was a product of me not knowing wealthy people, but also just having success um, with foundations. And so just pursuing that strategy. But um, individuals are, are more likely to give unrestricted funding or, or general operating support. So that's a priority for us going forward. And I guess the last point I would make, just which is very general, is thinking about how to broaden the audience for environmental coverage generally. So it's, you know, going back to that, you know, constituency issue where you, making a climate story, a health story or a finance story um, as a way to engage more people. But then also thinking about who are you trying to engage? Like Manga Bay is not trying to be a mass market publication because we find that it's very hard to change hearts and minds. Whereas if we're trying to reach, you know, like a specific a specific group, like I don't know, public prosecutors in Brazil who are looking at corruption around deforestation, um, informing that group is much more likely to lead to immediate outcomes. And then we go back to the funder, we can say, look, we did this investigation and it led to um, these things happening. And so it makes it easier to make our case that journalism does drive meaningful real world impact. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Rhett. Um, Rhett, do you still run advertise run ads on your on your on your site? And and how much of a if so, how much of a percentage of income does that provide you? So at advertising basically rounds to 0%. It's it's, wow. it's well below 1%. Um, the only ads we have on our main news site are ads that we don't, we can't take off because they're part of the comment system. Uh, and so we earn, I don't know, very little, <laughs> a marginal amount of revenue from that. Um, and then there are, all, there are also ads on some, you know, like on YouTube and things where we publish videos, um, which again, generates a very small amount of money for us. Do you think that an effort to work with advertisers to specifically support and boost coverage on climate and environment might work? I mean, there is, there are advertisers out there who want to support this. Do you think so for us as an organization, it doesn't make sense to invest resources in building out a sales team because that takes away from our journalism. So essentially we're pulling yeah. out our offering support. So if there is an initiative of like a, a collaboration uh, between a bunch of media outlets where there was like a sales team that was then okay. saying that we're going to get advertising and, you know, all the partners can, can then run on their website. That would be potentially of interest, but we'd also have to balance it with what will advertising, how much, how much revenue will we lose from donations because we have ads and how much right. will it degrade the user experience? So there's like, it's, there's multiple variables, but I feel like initiative like that would be generally helpful. Right. Thank you, Rhett. Uh, any other panelists want to respond, or I could just uh, fall as a uh, as a working features editor for a newspaper that I'm sure runs on advertising as well as maybe other sources. I mean, what do you do uh, as a as a working journalist to try and get more support for your work, your, more financial support for your work, maybe your team? I, I'd say that's that's a question for my management okay. <laughs> to answer <laughs> because it's not really up to us to do that. But what I've seen happen for many um, media houses in Nigeria is uh, uh, to really depend on um, funding organizations and foundations, and that is what has enabled them to you know um, thrive and get ahead. This is aside from the usual um, advertising that we depend on. And those um, advertising resources have, have really, really gone down in recent time. You know, we are a newspaper traditionally, and then we've had to transition to digital online. It's something that we're still trying to navigate. And um, one thing that we've done, you know, to raise funds was to actually engage in what we call editorial projects. And so actually that has to do with um, working with um, governments to um, uh, kind of like uh, showcase the good things that they've done, developmental projects that they've done. And that has brought in some, some, some money for us. But then it's not really sustainable because, um, you know, there are so many interests 
and you don't want to be seen to be, um, you know, uh, just um, singing someone's praise just because of uh, the funding that you're going to get from them at the end of the day. So it's um, it's, it's really um, a, well, I say, um, a difficult or tricky uh, situation that we find ourselves in. So we're just hoping for, let's say, we're just looking for the best. But for my organization, there are so many options that we put on ground, things that we could do. But really, really, there's a, a lot of deliberation going on about it. When it comes to um, donor funding, um, according to the reports, there's this skepticism about, okay, um, you're giving us this money. Are you now going to dictate um, yeah. what we're going to report on? You know, what are the... And, my organization is a legacy organization. We've been around since 1949. Mm -hmm. uh, it's owned by Chief of Bapemi is one of the most respected people we have in this country. And so if it's now heard that, okay, his newspaper is getting funding from some source and they begin to dig deeper, okay, where's this, who, who, who are the backers? You know, it's, it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot. So it's a very, very tricky situation for us. And... Uh, it's not an easy one. I can't really give you a very straight answer as to how we're trying to get this done. But basically, for us, it's been advertising, and for journalists who are reporting on environmental issues, we really have to depend on uh, grants to do good stories. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting because yeah, outsiders might question if funds come from philanthropy or other sources and might ask if that funding is tainted. Nobody ever seems to question if a media outlet gets advertising from a fossil fuel company or another business interest to run their ads. I mean, that presumably that hopefully that doesn't taint coverage, but you know, it's 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 interesting how we question some sources of funding, but maybe not others. So let me turn it over to Amy. I know, Amy, you do a lot of fundraising as part of your job. Uh, what do you think works? What doesn't work? Are there things you want to try? Yeah, I, I think there's actually, um, you know, a, a lot more funders are looking into funding climate change, um, mitigation and adaptation type um, interventions. Um you know, compared to a few years ago, I think definitely, you know, we see a lot more funding opportunities in, in this, uh, you know, with, with these themes. But I think the challenge is um, it's very hard to find opportunities that uh, look specifically at supporting journalism as an intervention. Um, so I think for us and also for uh, the journalists and media outlets that we work with, the, the challenge is how do we tap into these new you know, new and expanding um, sources of funding. Um, how do we get information, um, journalism in there um, as part of the solution? I think it's often um, neglected or undervalued as a solution. Um, there's a lot more interest in technology, like new techno technologies kind of, um, you know, testing out ways to capture carbon emissions or to track methane emissions and so on. There's a lot of interest in 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 new technologies, um, um, and 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 also, of course, definitely looking at ways to, um, you know, uh, push for policy changes. Um, but there's often a, a neglect in in terms of the importance of of public understanding. Uh, you know, uh, public support, um, you know, for changes to happen, um, you know, the general public um, citizens need to know, need to, to know what, um, what the, the problems are, what the root causes are, and how are they affected. Um, and, and journalists play a very important role in connecting these dots and, you know, what are the policy actions. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it, it it comes to us, you know, it becomes our, 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 a very important part of our job to actually make that point, get that point across to, to donors. It's really hard <laughs> because it's often a, a after afterthought. You know, often we see funders, you know, implementing, uh, have already, you know, given out grants, implementing activities, and then it occurred to them, oh, we actually need the journalists to be writing about these things. We need the people to know. 
And then they then come to us and said, oh, could you help with this and that? But, you know, the programs are really designed. It's, it's kind of a bit harder to kind of retrofit um, the information aspect of it into a, a, a programming. So, um, yeah, so that's what we, I think what we've been trying to do and keep doing is to find ways to speak to funders and tell them the importance of, you know, public education, public awareness raising um, and, and empowering, um, you know, uh, citizens with, with information. And um, we work very closely with local outlet, outlets. And I think it's really important to have this partnership between um, NGOs like us and um, to work very closely with uh, local media outlets um, to you know do joint fundraising go to the go to funders and talk to to them about uh, why this is important and needs to be funded thank you Amy um I I know we're running out of time we've got about three minutes left I do want to give everyone on the, on our panel uh, a, a last a last word. Um, and so, Gabby, I'm going to turn it over to you now. I uh, I hope you maybe can combine your final thoughts with any uh, any other insights as to what experiments you might be seeing out there in terms of, of improving financial viability. Just to have a couple of thoughts on that, we'd love to hear it. Well, actually, if you don't mind, I might just respond to what Amy just said instead, and I'll let others sure. talk about yeah. financial viability. Um, I think it's so important, Amy, what you just said, this this idea of journalism having the capacity to elevate public understanding, to build climate literacy, to enact that role of public education and ultimately empowerment. And ultimately, in my in my view, stimulate outrage, you know, for the injustices that are that are occurring in terms of um you uh, climate and environmental harms. So I think it's kind of gone out of fashion to speak about these things, you know, the, the whole, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the one way model of communication from expert to non-expert is, is been so questioned and it's gone out of fashion, but ultimately we do need someone to play that role and the media and good journalism is really well placed to do that in terms of climate. And there's no better time to, to do that than now. So I think in order to, um, you know, to stimulate stimulate that public public concern that we so need to see, which is the precursor for action. Um, we just need to do more good journalism, and it needs more funding. Um, and uh, you know, people just need to build that awareness of of the short time that we have, the very brief moment that we have now to make change um, before climate change really does become completely unmanageable. Um, so anyway, that's my my two cents. And I, I thank you for saying that, Amy, because that kind of stimulated that thought in terms of um, in, uh, financial sustainability. I'll let the others comment if that's OK. Thank you, Gabby. And thank you for leading us in all this important research. I think you can see it's really stimulated a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rhett now. I would note uh, Rhett for his final comments. There is an interesting question that just popped up. What should climate journalists working in newsrooms owned by suspected climate change deniers and environmental polluters do? That's a tough one. Although it may be an opportunity for you to change some minds and opinions in your own organization, but um, Gabby's going to take a, a shot at answering that one. Rhett, any final comments you want to uh, share with us, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just echo that this is, uh, I thought, a very useful report, and I think it's a, a really captures sort of what's what's going on around the world. So, so thank you for making the effort to put it, to put it together. Thank you, Rhett. Thank you for all your work with Mangabe. We we're, we're close partners, and uh, it's really been a pleasure working with your team. Paul, any final thoughts you want to share, please? Okay, so um, I just like to speak to the. Uh, um, climate denial so, question. You know, um, actually, uh, looking at the reports, we see that um, most of the um, uh, none of the countries in Africa, you know, uh, when asked the question whether they would include um, climate climate deniers or um, climate skeptics, none of them gave. None of the responses was up to fifty percent that said no. And um, the recommendation from the report is that um, we shouldn't include 
climate deniers in our reports. But um, I, I don't think um, ignoring them, you know, reduces their impact in any way. Because if you don't put them on your platform, they probably be on some other platform, you know, probably on social media, still going on, you know, doing the things that they do. They still be influencing people, even though you are not in reporting them on your platform. So not reporting them doesn't help the situation. What I think helps the situation will be to actually um, take what, whatever it is that they're saying, take knowledge of that, and then use that as an opportunity to tell the people the facts, tell them the truth. I don't think, um, you know, ignoring them is the way out of it. No, I, I think you should, you know, take whatever their arguments, whatever arguments they may propose, and then use that to counter them. You know, tell the people the truth. Don't just ignore them. Just like counseling them. I don't, I don't think we should not bring that into judgment. You know, let's, let's, let's not ignore anyone. Let's, let's use our platform to, to tell the truth. That's my two cents. Thank you, Paul. I totally, I, just, I totally get your point. We've got another comment in the Q&A asking EJ and Mangabe to create a special desk with capacity to help other people improve proposals uh, because journalists are not good <laughs> at planning proposals. That that's a possibility. Maybe we can uh, find a way to help with the uh, help help our partners improve their fundraising. But let me get turn it over to Amy for the final comments of this webinar. Uh, any any final thoughts you might want to have? You want, might want to share. Um. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I just think that journalists are resourceful people. Um. It is part of the job. You know. You. you <laughs> part of what it takes to be a journalist. So. Um. I think you know there is a massive job for us to do, and I really, um, think that um you know we can make the best use of um uh, our ability to tap into various resources and uh, work together to to not just uh, bring up problems but also um you know demonstrate the resilience of communities and to bring hope and action. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Paul, Rhett, Gabby. Thank, thanks all of you for sharing your time. I know we're we're past the hour mark. If we uh, you have to run, but um, we really appreciate your insights. Thanks to all of you out there who who joined the webinar, especially for your comments and your questions. We hope you found this interesting. We'll have a recording up on the EGN website, and we're going to be sending everyone a survey so we can get your feedback on the webinar. Please let us know what you thought of it. If there are ways we can improve it, we would really love to know that. So look out for that survey in your inbox. And for all those working in the field of climate and environmental journalism, keep up the great work. We know it's not easy, but you play a very important role. Thank you, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you.